I would like to springboard off of something that happens in 1st Nephi 16 and have what I think is a vital discussion to clarify an important doctrine and reality of the church. I am fascinated that it comes up in the 16th chapter of the Book of Mormon. Fascinated, first of all, that the Lord would include it in the scriptures, that Nephi would write it and the Lord would inspire him to include it in his record. Fascinated that he presents it so early in the Book of Mormon as if to say this is something you're going to have to wrestle with. Make your peace with this because some of you are going to struggle with this. And as I look around the church today, so many people are leaving the church because they misunderstand this concept that was presented not only on the title page of the Book of Mormon, we'll get to that in a minute, but in the 16th chapter. Here's the reality that we're going to have to wrestle with. Let's take a look at 1st Nephi chapter 16 so I can kind of show you this moment and invite all of us to wrestle with it and come to terms with it. Here's the situation. Nephi has broken his bow. Laman and Lemuel's bows have lost their elasticity. So they go without food and they're hungry. And that moment of hunger allows that human side of the prophet to come out. Nephi includes this phrase. It came to pass that Laman and Lemuel and the sons of Ishmael did begin to murmur exceedingly because of their sufferings and afflictions in the wilderness. Now notice this addition. And also my father began to murmur against the Lord his God. Yea, and they were all exceedingly sorrowful in that they did murmur against the Lord. Lehi? Lehi murmured against God? Now, here's the concept. Everything that God does is gold. There's the gold side. God does gold. He speaks, his words are gold, his actions are gold. But Heavenly Father hands his work over to mortals. He does it on purpose. He hands the gold into the hands of mortals and mortals are gonna get their fingerprints on the gold. It's not going to be the perfect shiny thing that it was when Heavenly Father handed it to us. Mortals put their fingerprints on it. And that's what I call the clay. That's the clay side of this, that human beings are imperfect and they make mistakes. And yet the Lord has handed his gospel to them. And we need to, be under, we need to understand that there is this mixture of gold and clay that what God hands to us in a perfect form gets mixed with clay. Everything that Heavenly Father hands to us is going to have that mixture. So Lehi is a prophet. Lehi certainly has the keys and the authority. He gets the inspiration to leave Jerusalem, saves their lives, because if they had stayed, they would have been destroyed by the Babylonians. Lehi has the inspiration and he's the key holder. But here we find Lehi murmuring, acting out like a human. And there's that mixture of gold and clay. And I wonder if it comes up early in the Book of Mormon as if the Lord is trying to say, here's an issue you need to wrestle with. If you expect everything in his church and in the kingdom to be pure gold, you're going to be disappointed because the Lord hands the gold into the hands of men who mix it with their own fingerprints and there's the golden clay mixture. The Lord uses ordinary human beings to do his work and humans are imperfect, and the Lord doesn't expect them to suddenly be perfect because he's asked them to do something. The Lord is okay, we'll get to this in a minute, but the Lord is okay with the mixture of golden clay. And you and I need to be okay with that as well. Let me point out that when Moroni took over the records after Mormon was killed in that final battle, and Moroni takes over the records, and Moroni knows he's the one that's going to deliver them. 
He's going to finish this record and he's going to deliver them to the Gentiles to be translated in our day. And he knows that they are the solution. This record is the solution to everything that's wrong in our day. But Moroni also knows that human beings put it together. Moroni is familiar with the mistakes of his father and his own mistakes. And he starts to become very concerned that you and I in our day will reject their writings, which were designed to save us from the challenges of our day because of the imperfections of men. Notice how often Moroni brings that up as he takes over the record. First, right after Mormon chapter eight, after Moroni takes over the record from his father, he's already including these words. In verse 12 of chapter eight, he says, and whoso receiveth this record and shall not condemn it because of the imperfections which are in it the same shall know of greater things. Right off the bat, as soon as he takes over, he's already saying, don't throw out the gold because there's a little clay here. We are imperfect and we've done our very best, but there are imperfections here. Don't throw out the gold because of the imperfections of human beings. There's the principle that everything in this gospel is going to be a mixture of gold and clay. Don't throw out the gold because there's a little clay. Notice how often it comes up. Moroni continues. Verse 17, just a few verses later. If there be faults, they are the faults of man. But behold, we know of no fault. Nevertheless, God knoweth all things. Therefore, he that condemneth, let him be aware, lest he shall be in danger of hellfire. We've done our best, but I know there's mistakes because we're imperfect. Don't throw away the gold because of the imperfection of man. Don't throw away gold because it got mixed with clay. He's going to repeat that over and over and over again. Again in chapter 9, Mormon chapter 9, verse 31, condemn me not because of mine imperfections neither my father because of his imperfections, neither them who have written before us. And then he includes this beautiful invitation, but rather give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections, that ye may learn to be more wise than we have been. Don't throw out the gold because it's mixed with a little clay. When he starts translating the book of Ether, you begin to see that kind of in that record. Chapter 12, he's getting very concerned because the, rec- the words of the brother of Jared are so powerful and so mighty. And I'm guessing Moroni is probably feeling a little self-conscious saying, my words aren't that mighty. What if people reject because I haven't written as eloquently as he did? And he's very aware of his own imperfections. But the Lord comforts him when he says, Lord, the Gentiles will mock at these things because of our weakness in writing. For Lord, thou hast made us mighty in word by faith, but thou hast not made us mighty in writing. For thou hast made all this people that they could speak much because of the Holy Ghost, which thou hast given them. And thou hast made us that we could write but little because of the awkwardness of our hands. Behold, thou hast not made us mighty in writing like unto the brother of Jared, for thou madest him that the things which are written are mighty as thou art, unto the overpowering of man to read them. Thou hast also made our words powerful and great, even that we cannot write them. Wherefore, when we write, we behold our weakness and stumble because of the placing of our words. And I fear lest the Gentiles will mock at our words. He must have seen our day and known that many people are doing just that. They are rejecting the gold because of the clay. But Moroni is pleading with us not to do that. Now, I love what the Lord says here. He says, And when I had said this, the Lord spake unto me, saying, Fools mock, but they shall mourn. 
and my grace is sufficient for the meek, that they shall take no advantage of your weakness. And then that beautiful verse, if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. But the setting of that verse is my grace is sufficient for the meek. And I think that's an invitation for you and I to say, the Lord has handed this gospel over to human beings and it's full of imperfections because mortals are imperfect. Be okay with that. If you will be humble, my grace is sufficient to show you that there's gold here, even though it's mixed with clay. Be patient, be humble, be meek, and mighty things will happen because of the gold, even though it was handed over to human beings, and you're going to see a lot of clay. Do you see that constantly being portrayed? Now, one more from Moroni. Let's go to the title page of the Book of Mormon, which Joseph says was written on the last leaf of the gold pages that he was allowed to translate. So it must have been the last insertion, which we suspect was Moroni. This is the great title page, but notice how the title page ends. After declaring that the Book of Mormon was written so that we might know that Jesus is the Christ and to know what kind of Christ he is, Moroni ends the title page with this invitation. It says, And now, if there be faults, they are the mistakes of men. Wherefore, here's the plea, ready? Condemn not the things of God, that ye may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. Don't condemn, don't throw out the gold. Don't condemn the things of God, the gold, because of the mistakes of men. Now look around today. How many are rejecting the gold, throwing out the things of God, throwing out the Book of Mormon and all its gold because it was handed, it, it was given to the hands of human beings? Now, just for fun, let me show you maybe what Moroni was worried about. Moroni was aware of the humanness of the authors of the Book of Mormon who were chiseling it into plates. He was aware that human beings make mistakes, and he's nervous that we're going to reject the book because they are imperfect. Can I just show you a couple fun moments where it's pretty clear to me that Mormon chiseling in plates made a typo? And I don't think you can erase in gold plates. I think you have to say, well, now how can I reword that? Because that's not what I meant to say. Let me show you a couple clay moments, a couple moments where I think Mormon manifests him his own imperfections. Here's kind of a funny one. In Alma chapter 24, verse 19. Now this is Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni, their mission to the Lamanites. There's been a conversion and they bury their weapons. They bury their weapons in the ground. Now listen to this and tell me if you don't sense Mormon just kind of, oh, I didn't mean to say it that way. And then he corrects himself. He says, and thus we see that these Lamanites were brought to believe and to know the truth. They were firm and would suffer even unto death rather than commit sin. And thus we see that they buried their weapons of peace. Whoops, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean to chisel weapons of peace. So I don't think he can scribble it out. So he just says, or they buried their weapons of war for peace. Now that's what he meant to say. But don't you think that's just kind of a manifestation of Mormon's humanness that he's chiseling on plates and he said weapons of peace? No, 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 that's not what I meant. So he just kind of corrects it, weapons of war for peace. I love that. And I would never throw out the story of Ammon and the missionaries going to the Lamanites and that beautiful conversion story because Mormon goofed and said weapons of peace. But you see the example, the clay got mixed with, or the gold got mixed with clay. What came into Mormon's head, the inspiration of, Lord, the, of the Lord on what to write, got mixed with the humanness of Mormon and what got chiseled out was maybe a typo. Let me show you another one. 
here in Alma chapter 43. It's another war image, and this is where Zarahemna has come to attack the, the Nephites. Captain Moroni is going to defend them in war. But notice the typo. Notice he must have chiseled the wrong word, and then he tried to correct it. This makes me smile. I love it. Mormon wrote, while on the other hand, there was now and then a man fell among the Nephites by the swords and the loss of blood, they being shielded from the more vital parts of the body. Whoops, that's not quite what I meant to say. Now notice him, cor he corrects himself. Or the more vital parts of the body being shielded from the strokes of the Lamanites by their breastplates and their arm shields and their head plates. And thus the Nephites did carry on the work of death among the Lamanites. Doesn't that make you smile a little bit? And you say, I love Mormon. He was a human being like I am. Inspired. The Lord's directing him. There's the gold going into his heart, going into his head. But coming out of that chisel or however he's doing it, he seems to have made a little bit of a mistake. He says that men fell because of swords and loss of blood. They, meaning the swords and loss of blood, being shielded from the more vital parts of the body. No, that's not quite what I meant to say. So then he corrects it. There's humanness here. And the Lord seems to be okay with it. And I think we need to be okay with the Lord handing his kingdom, his gold into the hands of men. One more, just so you can kind of see the humanness of Mormon who's chiseling this. Alma chapter 50 is kind of another war image. This is where Amalekiah has become king of the Lamanites and he's now attacking the, Lam the Nephites. Verse 32, Alma chapter 50, verse 32. And now behold, the people who were in the land bountiful, or rather Moroni feared that they would hearken to the words of Morianton. And the whole thing is Mor Moroni's fear. But I think that was a little bit of a, oh, no, that's not what I meant. Let me correct that. The people who were in the land bountiful, or rather Moroni feared. Do you see that correction? And again, it makes me smile. There is the humanness. And I think that's what Moroni is worried about. He knew his dad. He knew Nephi knew Le Lehi, and he knew he was a human being and had those moments where he did murmur. Moroni knew his dad. Moroni knew himself, and he knew that they were human, and humans make mistakes. And his great fear is, I'm worried that those in the latter days who receive this work are going to reject the things of God. They're going to condemn the things of God because of the mistakes of men. Let me show you another example. This makes me smile a little bit and scratch my head a little bit, but I have learned to love it because I have learned to love that gold and clay balance. And I, for one, am not going to reject the gold because it got mixed with clay. Here's an interesting one in the translation of the Book of Mormon. Now, what comes into the head of Joseph Smith, what's inspired, what's, what got put in Joseph Smith's mind was pure gold. And there's the Lord, pure gold. Now, what came out of Joseph's mouth what went into the ear of Oliver Cowdery and what came out of his pen, what got copied onto a second place. So we have the original manuscript and then he copies it to the, the printer's manuscript. What got sent to the printer and typeset, how many occasions in there were there human beings making mistakes? Now, what went into Joseph's head was pure gold. But the final product in the Book of Mormon has seen it mixed with clay. For example, here's one example. Joseph said the word, he shall wither as a dried reed. That's what Joseph said. He shall wither as a dried reed. What Oliver heard was weed. And he wrote weed on the original manuscript. Now, Joseph noticed it, or maybe Oliver, I don't know who noticed it, but it got corrected. It got crossed out, and we wrote the word read. 
But do you see, there was a human error. Joseph said, read, Oliver wrote, or heard and wrote, we. Do you see that mixture of gold and clay? And there's going to be several of those. Let me show you a very fascinating one. In Alma chapter 39, Corianton, Alma's son, has committed a, trans, a, a grievous transgression as a missionary, and Alma is rebuking him. Now, this is a page of the original manuscript where Oliver wrote down what Joseph translated. Now, what came out of Joseph's mouth and into Joseph's or Oliver's ear and out Joseph, Oliver's pen somewhere the gold is going to be mixed with the clay. Now, this is what the original manuscript says, and I'm so grateful for the works of Royal Skousen to discover this. I'd commend, I'd invite you to go discover the beautiful, wonderful work of Royal Skousen and trying to get back to the gold, trying to get back to what came into Joseph's head and see if we can identify some of the mistakes of men that got mixed in. But here's an interesting one. According to the original manuscript, what Alma said to us, and now this is way too faded. Look at this man. There's no way I can zoom in and show you this because it's been faded. But Royal was able through x-ray and all of that and all the modern tools to see it. And what he saw that was written on there is this. This is from Joseph Smith Papers. And what was written, what Alma said to his son was, but rather return unto them and acknowledge your faults and repair that wrong. Now there was a broke, there was a break in the paper. And so we don't quite see that wrong, but we see the T of that. But the word repair, was written on the original manuscript. So Joseph said, return unto them, acknowledge your faults and repair that wrong. So out of Joseph's head, repair. Into Oliver's ear, repair. And Oliver wrote. Now, how would Oliver have written, knowing the script of that day, how would Oliver have written repair? If you look at the original manuscript and if you look at the printer's manuscript, you know that Oliver would have written R E and he would have gone up to make the P. That's kind of how they wrote their P's. They would go up and come down and make a P. So the, the, the P would come up and it would be repair, repair. Now, Here's where we suspect, based on as we've x-rayed the document, we suspect that a little ink spilled and crossed that P. And so now it's R-E-P with a little ink stain. So when Oliver makes the printer's manuscript, when he's looking at the original, and then he writes the printer's manuscript. This is the printer's manuscript. Notice that repair became retain because the P got crossed and so he saw it as a T and he didn't notice the, bot the back R and turned it into an N. Repair became retain. And there's the humanness and there's the clay. Now this is an original copy of the Book of Mormon. And notice what it says, return unto them, acknowledge your faults and retain that wrong. There's the clay mixed in because of a little ink that spilled. Now, do you see the temptation? Some people are going to reject the things of God because there are mistakes, because there was clay along the way, because human beings are allowed to be human beings. Now, if you look at your modern day scriptures, you'll notice what they did. 
For many years, the Book of Mormon said, return, acknowledge your faults, and retain that wrong. Well, doctrinally, that's not correct. We don't retain our wrong. So in the 1920 edition of the Book of Mormon, James E. Talmadge, who oversaw that, felt like that's not correct. And so notice what they did. Here's the modern version. It simply says, return and acknowledge your faults and that wrong that you've committed. So we just took it out. It didn't make sense to say retain that wrong. So we just took it out. All because a little ink spilled over the P in repair. Again, I'm grateful for Royal Skousen for doing all the research that reveals this. But now here's the temptation. Are you going to be one of those that throws out the gold because of the clay? Now let me point out what Nephi did after his father murmured against the Lord. That doesn't nullify the fact that Lehi is the prophet. The Lord allows us to be imperfect. He still chooses us even when we're imperfect. So after Nephi builds a new bow, you know what he did, right? Tell me what he did. Let's read it. I, Nephi, did make out of wood a bow and out of a straight stick an arrow. Therefore, I did arm myself with a bow and an arrow, with a sling and with stones, and said unto my father, Whither shall I go to obtain food? He went to his father. His father is still the prophet. His father hasn't lost the ability to receive revelation because he had a human moment. He's still the prophet. And that humbled Lehi and he repented and he sought for inspiration and received it, which would suggest that the Lord acknowledges Lehi's imperfections and Lehi's humanness and gave him the inspiration, gave him the gold to know where food was. And Nephi went out and found and they ate. And that's the Lord's system. May I suggest to you that the Lord is okay with the mixture in the very beginning of the Doctrine and Covenants, section one. Now that wasn't received first. It was received later as the preface. Notice verse six, section one, verse six, the Lord calls this section the preface. He intended it to go in front. It is his preface. But notice what the Lord declares in his preface. First, he says in verse 17, Wherefore, I, the Lord, knowing the calamities which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant, Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven and gave him commandments. There's the handing off of the gold to the human being, knowing that it's going to get fingerprints and sand and clay in it. I, the Lord, to save you from the calamities that are coming, handed this to Joseph Smith and told him to proclaim it to the world. And then I love this. And also gave commandments to others that they should proclaim these things unto the world. And all this that it might be fulfilled, which was written by prophets. Now notice this declaration. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. Verse 21, the, but that every man might speak in the name of the Lord, even though you're imperfect and you make mistakes. I love how he words it in verse 24. The Lord says, I am God and have spoken it. These commandments are of me and were given unto my servants in their weakness. Can I let that just distill upon you? I, the Lord, spoke and gave this to my servants in their weakness, after the manner of their language that they might come to understanding. Tell me that the Lord isn't okay with the clay mixture. Isn't he saying, I know there's going to be clay mixed in with the gold. He seems to be okay with that. And I would suggest that we need to be okay with that. 
As I look around the church today, what I see is people rejecting the gold because of the clay. Their thinking is that if, if it's gold, it should be perfect. There should be no tarnish. There should be no fingerprints. If it's of God, it should be perfect. There's their expectation. But the Lord doesn't think that way. There is gold. And he hands it to men, which mixes it with clay. And we must not, there's the invitation from the very beginning of the Book of Mormon, we must not condemn the things of God because of the mistakes of men. For all these years that the, the gospel has been restored, for all, those, all these years that the gospel has been in the hands of human beings, we have made some mistakes. Our history is full of human mistakes. It doesn't take long for you to find them. Now the question is, are you going to reject the gold because it got mixed with clay? Or, like Nephi, will you still go to Lehi and say, I recognize who you are. I recognize that you're also human. But I recognize that you are the authorized servant and you're the one that's going to receive the revelation. Where do I go to find food? And then comes the gold. Oh, how I testify to you that this restoration is filled with gold. Oh, how I love the Book of Mormon. It is gold. But do I recognize the clay? Yes. And I appreciate that. Because if the Lord is okay with their imperfections, that means the Lord is okay with mine. I love how jo Joseph said this. One time he said, this is someone reporting, so it's kind of third person. He, meaning Joseph Smith, said he was but a man and they must not expect him to be perfect. If they expected perfection from him, he should expect it from them. But if they would bear with his infirmities and the infirmities of the brethren, he would likewise bear with their infirmities. I love that. I think Heavenly Father's kind of behind that saying, I don't expect any of you to be perfect. I'm okay with the imperfection. I'm okay with trying and falling. I'm okay, Nephi, that the first time you tried to get the plates, you didn't succeed, and then you tried again, and then you didn't succeed, and then you tried again. I'm okay with the humanness in you. But I think implied in that is an invitation. Will you be okay with the humanness in his leaders, in his kingdom, in his church? in our history, in everything that we do, there is clay mixed with the gold. Oh, how I love the gold. One last example. Simon's writer apostatized from the church and was part of the party that tarred and feathered Joseph Smith because Joseph misspelled his name. He misspelled his last name, Simon's writer. Now, his thinking was that if Joseph's a prophet and is inspired to call him on a mission, if he's getting inspiration on where to send him, he should know how to spell his name. And there's the not, I think that's the incorrect assumption, that because prophets get some information, they get all information. Because God tells them some things, he tells them all things. And that is not true. That violates the gold and the clay principle. But because Joseph misspelled his name, Simon's writer apostatized and turned against Joseph. Now let me share with you kind of something that I love and makes me smile. I will show you very small snippets of my patriarchal blessing because it's private, but I want to show you a little snippet. This is how you spell my name. My middle name is spelled L-A-Y-N-E. This is from the upper part of my patriarchal blessing where you're typing out the applicant's name, the recipient's name. 
Bryce Lane Dunford, L-A-Y-N-E. Now, let me show you the very first words of my patriarchal blessing. Do you see it? They misspelled my name. I, I suppose it was the patriarch's wife who's doing the transcribing. He said my last name and she typed it as L-A-N-E. Now, does that nullify the gold that came through that patriarch and to my heart because a human being had a typo? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That blessing is gold. And I am grateful for the reminder every time I read it that the Lord has lovingly placed his gold in the hands of human being. And there's going to be typos. And there's going to be human error. May you and I be like Nephi and go right back to Lehi. Where do I go to find food? And may we understand that balance between gold and clay. I leave you my solemn witness that this restoration is filled with his gold, but that it has been handed to human beings and is now mixed a little bit with clay. It does not nullify the fact that there is gold. Of that I testify in the name of Jesus Christ.